Georgia journey. And Addie just stepped into my life even like a superhero and was like, let me prepare you for the craziest journey of your life. And it has been a time getting to know Addie and just soaking in her wisdom and her coaching and her training. I am excited to hear her speak on a level that I've not really heard from her a lot of recently. But before we begin, I would love to pray for her and pray for this night. But girls, we're going to turn into superhero mode because Addie is my superhero. And one of our coaching sessions, I couldn't get through it without crying then, but we're going to get through it tonight. But I want you all to stand and feel part like this for me. And we're going to ask the Lord to empower us and just come into our lives and ignite us with the Spirit tonight. So put your hands up and put them on your hips for me. Let's stick your chest out like this. And I just want you to close your eyes. And I want you to feel like the most powerful woman in the world at this moment. And now I want you to picture the Lord's face. superhero woman you have made us to be, a girl that is not, that cannot be stopped by the world. God, we love you, and we give this night to you, and then we pray. Amen! Amen! Oh my goodness. Ladies, I am so honored to be here. Is it so nice to be in the same room with people. Can we, can we clap to that? That's just Woo. good. I feel like after two years of crazy, I don't know what else you're gonna call it, it's just so nice to be able to spend time in fellowship and in worship and in prayer. I'm so honored to be here and thank the Williams family and the Commerce campus and the well, and just to be here and talk about something that well, it's very personal, but I think it touches all of us. And um, so I'm just excited. And uh, I love the, the superhero stance that, that <laughs> it's like God has done tonight. Because um, that's very much a thing. It, 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 apparently, it's the truth. You get in superhero mode, and you put your hand up and your head up, and you go, <sighs> but you know what? There's something really, really powerful when you put prayer with it. So I mean, good stuff. <laughs> I mean, right? Good stuff. Awesome. Well, guys, I am Addie Sheik, as she just said, and I am the proud wife of my husband, Lance, who's been married almost three years. Um, I am a proud stepmom to two wonderful young men, uh, Andrew and Daniel. I am the proud dog mom. I think there's pictures somewhere in that, but uh, yes, there you go. They're too cute. I had to show them. Uh, Molly is the big floofy one, and Sadie is the shorter one that <laughs> has that kind of voice, but that's okay. Uh, they're wonderful. And uh, I am also very proud to be the Director of Marketing and Communications for a ministry called Thornwell. We are a nearly 150-year-old organization in Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina dedicated to the prevention of child abuse and neglect, building and reuniting families, and strengthening communities in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are so excited as we soon celebrate 150 years in 2025 that God has paved a way to reach these families at their most vulnerable, to walk alongside them and through God empower them to change their path and their journey or to make something different in their lives in a way that they can feel healing and wholeness. We know that as individuals, we can't do this, but we know with God and with people like you, with the generosity of people like you, we are, we are changing lives and we are changing the outcomes. And we are so grateful for that. And so I'm just honored that every single day I get to come to work and that's what I get to do. 
Uh, and so I wanted to first start by thanking you tonight if uh, you felt so compelled to give to foster care resources. Foster care is a huge part of who we are at Thornwell. And it's so wonderful to see and feel uh, those, those gifts, not only to Thornwell, but to foster care um, opportunities throughout your community because it just takes a village. It takes a village. I know in South Carolina alone, there are over 1,400 kids who don't have a place to call home tonight. I don't know what the Georgia number is. I probably should have looked that up. But the fact that when you give, you're providing home, you're providing respite, you're providing sometimes as little as a stuffed animal, but to them it means the world. So of course I wanted to start out thanking you in that way. My husband and I, like I said, we've been married about three years, and uh, we are lovers of antique shopping. Any, any antique shopping people around here? A couple. All right, sounds good. Uh, and, you know, as we've been home over the last two years or so, there's not a ton else to do, so we've gotten a lot of time to do home renovations. Anybody get on the home reno kick while they were in? Yeah, okay, a couple of you too. All right, so we've been looking at antique stores and we like things that tell a story. And we found along the way that our style is kind of this blend of traditional and some modern touches and some pops of color. And so I was looking on Pinterest the other day and led to reading some blogs, you know, that typical wormhole. And <laughs> I found a word that matched my style and it was called Grand Millennial. Ooh. <laughs> okay, Grand Millennial. Grand Millennial, literally the definition, things that you find in your grandmother's house but also mixed in with modern. So I think they're saying that I'm secretly 75 on the inside, but I was like, <laughs> okay, all right, that, that jives. Uh, so an interesting part about the Grand Millennial trend, which is apparently a thing, is that things are coming back that I am very surprised about. So not only the brown furniture, the mahogany furniture that I love dearly, but things like needlepoint. Needlepoint. Anybody know what needlepoint is? Who, show of hands, who knows? Raise them high, who knows what needlepoint is? Okay, better question, who doesn't know what needlepoint is? Okay, we got a few. Are you guys like under 20? Yeah, okay. Right, needlepoint, uh, anybody ever do cross stitch and home ec? They ever even have home ec anymore? Am I dating myself? Okay. So, creates these beautiful scapes on the front. They can be flowers, they can be sunsets, they can be, you know, those cute little sayings and frames that are in your grandmother's bathroom. Um, they, that, that's needlepoint. Um, I've tried it a couple times, and I tell you what, Sometimes my needle point always turns out something like this. <laughs> like that. Um, the back of a needle point is messy. It's messy because it's supposed to look like this. Yeah, isn't that nice? Why the only thing that I had was a Mountain Dew can, I don't know, but Google failed me. Um, I literally was like messy needle point and that was all I had. But it's a nice way to say, there's the mess. There's the final product. So I already have this in my head as I was preparing to speak to you guys tonight. And a little bit struggling, to be honest. What to say? It's a big night, first well of 2022, no pressure. <laughs> and I was already thinking, you know, needlepoint from all the blogs. And I, but trust me, that wasn't where I was going with this whole thing. Until I had a wonderful time of fellowship with a dear friend that I haven't seen in well over a year. We've been separated due to COVID. Um, she's in the healthcare field and has to be very, very careful, very stringent regulations. And so for the first time, now that she's changed jobs and that isn't um, quite the, the level of weight anymore, we were able to visit oh, and it was so good. It was so good to just spend time in the same room and to laugh and to cry and to thank God for that moment together. And I gotta be honest, it wasn't the easiest of times for her and I in this last year. And at one point, one particular poignant moment, Ellen goes, you know, I feel like we're just looking at life from the wrong side of the needle point. <laughs> okay, okay, I got it. Trying to make sense of the knots and the pulls and the mess of colors in the back of the needle point. And I thought, how many times a day am I doing this? 
God's up there weaving and embroidering my life. And I can't see what he's doing from his perspective. All I'm seeing is the mess. So I said, okay, God, all right, I'm looking into this. And so I came across a story, and I wanted to share with you because it really seemed to sum up where I was to get us started. It's from a gentleman. I don't know his name. It says unknown. I'd love to look it up one day, but it's really poignant. It says, when I was a little boy, my mother used to embroider a great deal. I would sit at her knee and look up from the floor and ask what she was doing. She informed me that she was embroidering. I told her that it looked like a mess from where I was. As from the underside, I watched her work with the boundaries of the little round hoop that she held in her hand. And I complained to her that it sure looked messy from where I sat. And she would smile at me and she'd look down gently and say, my son, you will go about your playing for a while. And when I'm finished with my embroidery, I will put you on my knee and let you see it from my side. I would wonder why she was using some dark threads along with the bright ones and why they seemed so jumbled from my view. A few minutes would pass, and then I would hear my mother's voice say, son, come and sit on my knee. This I did only to be surprised and thrilled to see a beautiful flower or a sunset, and I couldn't believe it, because underneath, it looked so messy. Then my mother would say to me, my son, from underneath it did look messy and jumbled, but you did not realize that there was a pre-drawn plan on top. It was a design and I was only following it. Now look at it from my side and you will see what I was doing. And many times through the years, I have looked up to my heavenly father and said, Father, what are you doing? And he has answered, I'm embroidering your life. And I say, but it looks like a mess to me. It seems so jumbled and the threads seem so dark. And why can't they all be bright? And the father seems to tell me, my child, you go about your business of doing my business. Mm -hmm. And one day I will bring you to heaven and put you on my knee and you will see the plan from my side. Mm -hmm. Notice that God doesn't say soon, I will tell you or I'll tell you tomorrow. He says, focus on the business of doing my business and one day his side of heaven you will see the plan from his perspective you know we've heard that there is beauty and waiting on the lord and if you're like me stubborn type a list planner i was given a planner tonight that's how much people know me know me very well i love it it's great it doesn't exactly feel like there's beauty in waiting. I get it. I don't like the messy underside of my needle point. And there are so many times that I want to take my own needle and take it upon myself to make my own stitches from the other side. And I just make a mess of things. I want to make things that I want so desperately to happen in an instant. Mm -hmm. Tell you a story. When I was in my mid-twenties, I, uh, I started to panic. In true Southern girl fashion, that I'm simply becoming too old, too old. And it was going to be that I was gonna become the last one to get married, I was gonna be the last one to have children, and I just, just couldn't have that. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed that God would just drop him down from the sky and he'd be perfect. Did that happen for anybody? <laughs> no, it didn't happen for me either. I told God that I would be the best wife and Christian and mother. Just, oh, don't let me be 30 and not married. I'm not sure why I have this in my idea like I was stuck in like 1865 or something, but you know, anyway. Needless to say, I didn't get a magical man floating down from heaven. And, however, I did get a Match.com account. Okay. Before anyone bristles, I'm not saying that God can't lead you to your spouse through Match.com or, or any of the other ones. Um, for me, however, I use that account as a way to try and just get the job done. Let's find a boyfriend, let's get married, and let's get this show on the road. 
And that account, or on that account, or whatever the lingo is, I met a guy. Um, let's call him Adam. Adam was my age, college educated, even getting his master's degree. His profile said that he was a Christian and liked dogs, so check. We went on our first date, and it was uh, fine. It was fine. It wasn't horrible. So already the bar was like, low. And that night, I heard a small voice saying, move on, Addy. Not him. Hmm. Edit this. <laughs> so we go on to date a few more months uh, before I learned that he wasn't actually a believer. He wasn't actually into the whole idea at all. And it was while I was in the Christian bookstore buying him a Bible for beginners that I heard the voice again. Move on, Hattie. Show him love. Pray for him. But he's not the one for you. But, but, but I could change him. <laughs> Somebody's laughing now. I could lead by example, and he could see me on fire for Jesus, and someday he would be too, and we would be okay. And I wouldn't be an old maid by 30. God, please, please, just change his heart. I didn't realize that I needed God to change mine. For a year, I was the missionary in that relationship. I focused on changing his heart and his mind about God, and he came with me to church, and I got involved in the music ministry, and I remember him one day saying to me, I just don't know why things had to change. You weren't like this when we first met. Oof. You would think that even that would make me stop and recognize what God was saying to me in that moment. But uh, I'd have to go through some pretty, pretty big heartbreak to learn that lesson. On October 30th, 2016, in front of the Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina, he got down on one knee. Hidden in front or of the surrounding trees was my sister and my best friends and a surprise photographer and they had clothes and we had a photo shoot and we had lunch on the grounds and I had this beautiful diamond on my hand and we drive home later that night and our families were there and we had a surprise engagement dinner and it was a wonderful day and I thought finally I'm getting married but within a week a week things took a turn you know he was angry and he was touchy about everything and he would raise his voice if I even wanted to start talking about the wedding. And he accused me of things that didn't make sense. And everything I worked so hard to build, block by block, just seemed to be crashing down. It's like he seemed to be repulsed at the idea of it all. And I didn't understand why he asked if that's how he felt. I didn't understand what was going on. And I was just hurting. About a week goes by, it's late one night, can't sleep, I'm kind of sad, shouldn't be sad, I'm kind of sad. And I get on social media, as we all do, and my friend Caroline had just recently gotten married. And on social media, she put up her wedding video. I'm sitting there and I'm watching it and I'm smiling because she looks so beautiful. And her husband looks so happy and is looking at her the way you just want your spouse to look at you on that day and every day after. And they start moving into the vows. And her husband looks at her and says, you are the woman that I have prayed for my entire life. It's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You are the woman that I have prayed for my entire life. And I have to say, I sat there silent for a long time, well after the video had ended, and I couldn't say a word. And I heard that small voice again in that moment, and it said, he will never be able to 
will say that to you. Mm. And I realized, finally, in that moment, with a diamond on my hand, that it was all a lie. This lie that I had perpetuated in my own arrogance. I was telling God that I knew better. I was making a mess of things. That he had a plan. That engagement ended. I must say I was less heartbroken than I was just sad and embarrassed. It was the greatest desire of my heart at the time to be married, so much so that I was willing to sacrifice what God had for me in his time for what I thought worked in mine. But there's a funny thing about the desires of your heart. They don't often come easy. And they usually come with some hard and beautifully valuable lessons along the way. I'm reminded of the story of Sarah and Abraham. God calls out Abraham from among the worshipers of false gods and leads him to a promised land. And Abraham believes in a God who has a voice, one that speaks to him while the stone statues remain silent. And Sarah, his wife, she isn't just along for the ride. She is also seeking this one true God. And I wonder sometimes if she protested when Abraham tells her they're going to be moving away from all that's familiar. But Abraham and Sarah obeyed. Now we do know that Sarah bears the burden of an empty womb. And like so many strong women throughout scripture, we see the pain of infertility and how God withholds his blessing for a greater purpose. But God promises Abraham a son. He tells Abraham to look up into the night sky and promises that the number of his descendants would be as the number of stars. So how's that going to happen when his wife can't have children? Years go by and Sarah remains childless. Her heart aches and her faith wavers. How could the promises possibly be true? Why? Why is God taking so long? And so Sarah, like many of us, decides to help God along with his promise. <laughs> so perhaps the child of God doesn't, this, well, this is a little early. Perhaps the child doesn't have to come directly from her body. Perhaps her Egyptian servant is young and healthy and she could bear the child for her. And Abraham agrees to this plot. Of course he does. And Ishmael is born. <laughs> it's a girl tonight. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Their entire tribe rejoices that Abraham is overjoyed. His heart's desire has been met. He was good. Sarah, on the other hand, is filled with jealousy. And her once faithful servant is looking at her with scorn, perhaps thinking she's more highly favored because she was able to provide the son. That Sarah could not. Whenever we take matters into our own hands, we end up facing obstacles we wouldn't have had to otherwise. I will say that again. Whenever we take matters into our own hands, we end up facing obstacles we wouldn't have had to otherwise. Sarah makes a mess of this whole situation, and all the while, God still has a plan, but waiting on the Lord has never been so difficult. And yet, in that long-awaited moment, God's promise is fulfilled. He blesses her, and Sarah bears a son at an old age of 90 years old. 90. Can you imagine having longed for a child for over half a century? Begging God, waiting for God, trying to believe in his promises. <laughs> oh, how I identify with Sarah. So 
many levels. In fact, sometimes in the very midst of my impatience, my sweet husband has taken to nicknaming me Sarah, <laughs> skipping the Hagar part, of course. Uh, today, I am married to a man who loves Jesus more than he loves me. And on our wedding day, unprompted, not knowing the story, he looked at me and said, you are the woman I have prayed for my entire life. <laughs> Getting to love him feels redemptive. Getting to love him feels like more than I deserve considering how much of a mess I'm trying to make things on my own. I should mention I was 31 when I got married, and interestingly enough, the world didn't end. So. <laughs> God knew what he was doing then. In the midst of my perceived sorrows, I know that he knows what he's doing now. I identify with Sarah in a lot of ways. I'm waiting on the Lord again. This time, I'm waiting for a child. It's been two and a half years for us, and we're trying. And all I'm seeing is the underside of God's needlepoint and the knots and the loops and the dark threads. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. But this time, though, I recognize what I didn't recognize before. And that's the beauty in the waiting. Mm -hmm. And even in the midst of this painful and uh, uncertain time, I'm learning. I'm learning three important lessons. First, waiting on the Lord produces patience. James 1, 2 through 8 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him or her ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Ladies, what kind of woman do you want to be here? I know who I've been. I've been the one asking God why, but doubting that he'll give me the answer. I'm trying to be the woman who asks God for wisdom without doubting, knowing that he will give it because he promises waiting on the Lord produces patience. The second lesson, God provides us strength when we wait on him. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I love this one. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we are waiting on the Lord, we are given the opportunity to grow in him, see his attributes working in our lives, and give up our own control, no matter how scary that is. And the third lesson, waiting on the Lord gives us direction and a vision. Sarah took matters into her own hands, and it caused her a lot of grief. Same girl. Often God needs to work out details that we cannot see. He is embroidering our life. And as we learn to wait on God, his will becomes clearer, and we begin to understand our purpose in greater detail. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
And everyone who completes or competes rather for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I love how Paul compares training for a race with disciplining his body, because we all need that discipline. Waiting for the Lord forces us to bring our bodies into subjection and focus our attention solely on God's will. I'll wrap this up with one of my favorite verses from Proverbs. It's Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil and it will be help to your flesh and strength to your bones. Ladies, some of you may find yourself tonight staring upwards into the messy side of your needle point. You may be wondering what to do next or confused by your circumstances. You may be struggling to believe God's promises. But I tell you tonight in the same mantra that it is for me that God hears you. He is present. He sends encouragement and hope for those who are waiting. Instead of asking God why he's taking so long, I encourage you to ask instead for wisdom. He promises he will give it. We can't doubt it. Seek what he wants you to learn in this season on this side of heaven as he weaves this beautiful tapestry of our lives. And when we do get to see what he's been creating, how glorious will that be? Ladies, let us pray. Father God, we come to you tonight so grateful that you are near. That even in this waiting and hurting and in this time of great trial that you, God, are always good. Show us your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us so that the desires of our heart are also yours. Help us to remember that waiting, waiting produces patience and gives us that direction and that vision you have for our lives. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us. We know these last two years have been long Sometimes it can be feeling like we're all working on the messy side of the needle point. But Father, we know that this illness, that these trials are not bigger than you. Amen. We know you will make a way. And we trust.